Chapter 2 of The Early History of the Airplane by Orville and Wilbur Wright How We Made the First Flight by Orville Wright The flights of the 1902 glider had demonstrated the efficiency of our system of maintaining equilibrium and also the accuracy of the laboratory work upon which the design of the glider was based. We then felt that we were prepared to calculate in advance the performance of machines with a degree of accuracy that had never been possible with the data and tables possessed by our predecessors. Before leaving camp in 1902, we were already at work on the general design of a new machine which we proposed to propel with a motor. Immediately upon our return to Dayton, we wrote to a number of automobile and motor builders, stating the purpose for which we desired a motor, and asking whether they could furnish one that would develop eight brake horsepower, with a weight complete not exceeding 200 pounds. Most of the companies answered that they were too busy with their regular business to undertake the building of such a motor for us, but one company replied that they had motors rated at eight horsepower, according to the French system of ratings, which weighed only 135 pounds, and that if we thought this motor would develop enough power for our purpose, they would be glad to sell us one. After an examination of the particulars of this motor, from which we learned that it had but a single cylinder of four inch bore and five inch stroke, we were afraid it was much overrated. Unless the motor would develop a full eight brake horsepower, it would be useless for our purpose. Finally, we decided to undertake the building of the motor ourselves. We estimated that we could make one of four cylinders with four inch bore and four inch stroke, weighing not over 200 pounds, including all accessories. Our only experience up to that time in the building of gasoline motors had been in the construction of an air-cooled motor, 5-inch bore and 7-inch stroke, which was used to run the machinery of our small workshop. To be certain that four cylinders of the size we had adopted, 4-inch by 4-inch, would develop the necessary 8 horsepower, we first fitted them in the temporary frame of simple and cheap construction. In just six weeks from the time the design was started, we had the motor on the block testing its power. The ability to do this so quickly was largely due to the enthusiastic and efficient services of Mr. C. E. Taylor, who did all the machine work in our shop for the first as well as the succeeding experimental machines. There was no provision for lubricating either cylinders or bearings while this motor was running. For that reason, it was not possible to run it more than a minute or two at a time. In these short tests, the motor developed about 9 horsepower. We were then satisfied that, with proper lubrication and better adjustments, a little more power could be expected. The completion of the motor according to drawing was, therefore, proceeded with at once. While Mr. Taylor was engaged with this work, Wilbur and I were busy in completing the design of the machine itself. The preliminary tests of the motor having convinced us that more than 8 horsepower would be secured, we felt free to add enough weight to build a more substantial machine than we had originally contemplated. For two reasons, we decided to use two propellers. In the first place, we could, by the use of two propellers, secure a reaction against a greater quantity of air, and at the same time use a larger pitch angle than was possible with one propeller. And in the second place, by having the propellers turn in opposite direction, the gyroscopic action of one would neutralize that of the other. The method we adopted of driving the propellers in opposite directions by means of chains is now too well known to need description here. We decided to place the motor to one side of the man so that in case of a plunge head first, the motor could not fall upon him. In our gliding experiments, we had had a number of experiences in which we had landed upon one wing, but the crashing of the wing had absorbed the shock so that we were not uneasy about the motor in case of a landing of that kind. To provide against the machine rolling over forward in landing, 
we designed skids like sled runners, extending out in front of the main surfaces. Otherwise, the general construction and operation of the machine was to be similar to that of the 1902 glider. When the motor was completed and tested, we found that it would develop 16 horsepower for a few seconds, but that the power rapidly dropped till, at the end of a minute, it was only 12 horsepower. Ignorant of what a motor of this size ought to develop, we were greatly pleased with its performance. More experience showed us that we did not get one half of the power we should have had. With 12 horsepower at our command, we considered that we could permit the weight of the machine with operator to rise to 750 or 800 pounds and still have as much surplus power as we had originally allowed for in the first estimate of 550 pounds. Before leaving for our camp at Kitty Hawk, we tested the chain drive for the propellers in our shop at Dayton and found it satisfactory. We found, however, that our first propeller shafts, which were constructed of heavy gauge steel tubing, were not strong enough to stand the shocks received from a gasoline motor with light flywheel, although they would have been able to transmit three or four times the power uniformly applied. We therefore built a new set of shafts of heavier tubing, which we tested and thought to be abundantly strong. We left Dayton September 23 and arrived at our camp at Kill Devil Hill on Friday the 25th. We found their provisions and tools, which had been shipped by freight several weeks in advance. The building, erected in 1901 and enlarged in 1902, was found to have been blown by a storm from its foundation posts a few months previously. While we were awaiting the arrival of the shipment of machinery and parts from Dayton, we were busy putting the old building in repair and erecting a new building to serve as a workshop for assembling and housing the new machine. Just as the building was being completed, the parts and material for the machines arrived simultaneously with one of the worst storms that had visited Kitty Hawk in years. The storm came on suddenly, blowing 30 to 40 miles an hour, increased during the night and the next day was blowing over 75 miles an hour. In order to save the tar paper roof, we decided it would be necessary to get out in this wind and nail down more securely certain parts that were especially exposed. When I ascended the ladder and reached the edge of the roof, the wind caught under my large coat, blew it up around my head and bound my arms till I was perfectly helpless. Wilbur came to my assistance and held down my coat while I tried to drive the nails. But the wind was so strong I could not guide the hammer and succeeded in striking my fingers as often as the nails. The next three weeks were spent in setting the motor machine together. On days with more favorable winds we gained additional experience in handling a flyer by gliding with the 102 machine, which we had found in pretty fair condition in the old building, where we had left it the year before. Mr. Chanute and Dr. Spratt, who had been guests in our camp in 1901 and 1902, spent some time with us, but neither one was able to remain to see the test of the motor machine, on account of the delays caused by trouble which developed in the propeller shafts. While Mr. Chanute was with us, a good deal of time was spent in discussion of the mathematical calculations upon which we had based our machine, he informed us that, in designing machinery, about 20% was usually allowed for the loss in the transmission of power. As we had allowed only 5%, a figure we had arrived at by some crude measurements of the friction of one of the chains when carrying only a very light load, we were much alarmed. More than the whole surplus in power allowed in our calculations would, according to Mr. Chanute's estimate, be consumed in friction in the driving chains. After Mr. Chanute's departure, we suspended one of the drive chains over a sprocket, hanging bags of sand on either side of the sprocket of a weight approximately equal to the pull that would be exerted on the chains when driving the propellers. By measuring the extra amount of weight needed on one side to lift the weight on the other, we calculated the loss in transmission. 
this indicated that the loss of power from this source would be only five per cent as we originally estimated but while we could see no serious error in this method of determining the loss we were very uneasy until we had a chance to run the propellers with the motor to see whether we could get the estimated number of turns the first run of the motor on the machine developed a flaw in one of the propeller shafts which had not been discovered in the test at dayton the shafts were sent at once to dayton for repair and were not received again until november twenty having been gone two weeks we immediately put them in the machine and made another test a new trouble developed the sprockets which were screwed on the shafts and locked with nuts of opposite thread persisted in coming loose after many futile attempts to get them fast we had to give it up for that day and went to bed much discouraged however after a night's rest we got up the next morning in better spirits and resolved to try again while in the bicycle business we had become well acquainted with the use of hard tire cement for fastening tires on the rims we had once used it successfully in repairing a stopwatch after several watchsmiths had told us it could not be repaired if tire cement was good for fastening the hands on a stopwatch why should it not be good for fastening the sprockets on the propeller shaft of a flying machine we decided to try it we heated the shafts and sprockets melted cement into the threads and screwed them together again this trouble was over the sprockets stayed fast just as the machine was ready for test bad weather set in it had been disagreeably cold for several weeks so cold that we could scarcely work on the machine for some days but now we began to have rain and snow and a wind of twenty five to thirty miles blew for several days from the north while we were being delayed by the weather we arranged a mechanism to measure automatically the duration of a flight from the time the machine started to move forward to the time it stopped the distance traveled through the air in that time and the number of revolutions made by the motor and propeller a stopwatch took the time an anemometer measured the air traveled through and a counter took the number of revolutions made by the propellers the watch anemometer and revolution counter were all automatically started and stopped simultaneously from data thus obtained we expected to prove or disprove the accuracy of our propeller calculations on november twenty eighth while giving the motor a run indoors we thought we again saw something wrong with one of the propeller shafts on stopping the motor we discovered that one of the tubular shafts had cracked immediate preparation was made for returning to dayton to build another set of shafts we decided to abandon the use of tubes as they did not afford enough spring to take up the shocks of premature or missed explosions of the motor solid tool steel shafts of smaller diameter than the tubes previously used were decided upon these would allow a certain amount of spring the tubular shafts were many times stronger than would have been necessary to transmit the power of our motor if the strains upon them had been uniform but the large hollow shafts had no spring in them to absorb the unequal strains wilbur remained in camp while i went to get the new shafts i did not get back to camp again till friday the eleventh of december saturday afternoon the machine was again ready for trial but the wind was so light a start could not have been made from level ground with the run of only sixty feet permitted by a monorail track nor was there enough time before dark to take the machine to one of the hills where by placing the track on a steep incline sufficient speed could be secured for starting in calm air 